And then the Buddha, there's, a, um, I mean, there's very way, various ways of telling it. There were sutras about the medicine Buddha. And um, there were seven brothers who, in another universe, like many, many aeons ago, who became medicine Buddhas. Which means that um, in addition to teaching the Four Noble Truths, as all Buddhas do, which how many of you know the Four Noble Truths, by the way? How many people here know the Four Noble Truths? I don't know. Many, okay. How many have never heard, really, of the Four Noble Truths, or brand new to the Four Noble Truths? Yeah, and then there's some that's sort of really in between. Have two or three? <laughs> well, Four Noble Truths is like a medical diagnosis, which the Buddha made his primary teaching. And actually, all of his later, most complicated teachings all fit into that. And basically, they are the, that the unenlightened life is suffering, which will never be satisfactory. The cause of that is, a, is fundamentally craving, anger, and ignorance. Especially ignorance is the root cause. And ignorance is defined not as just not knowing something, it's knowing something that is not the case. That, you know, knowing something wrongly and being stuck in that mistaken knowledge. But his that's the diagnosis of the cause. Then the prognosis is however one can free oneself from that with wisdom, meaning knowing the reality of oneself and the world. And then the therapy is called the Eightfold Path, which is like a whole set of educations, ethical education, mental education, and intellectual education, like scientific, about the nature of reality. And... Um, so all Buddhas teach that, so in a way all Buddhas really are therapists rather than prophets, you know, because they, they contradict, uh, Buddha contradicted the religious teachings of his time, that, and uh, Buddhists would contradict other religious teachings in the sense that there is somebody outside, a god, or several gods, or a goddess, who's going to save you. And um, the Buddha said that actually if the, if the gods had the power to save us all, we'd all be saved already. <laughs> and we're not, we're suffering. So the reason is not that the gods are bad, they would like us to be saved, because the Buddha didn't disbelieve the existence of gods. He talked to them actually, at least in the sutras they say he did, and they talked to him. But um, they just were not omnipotent and they were not omniscient. They were very knowledgeable and very powerful, but not omnipotent. So they just didn't have the power to save another person from suffering. So, or even themselves, some of them. Because they take, the problem with gods is they tend to become a little bit egotistical. Because they think, hey, I'm God, wow. <laughs> they get really excited about it. And uh, whereas Buddha is not, and uh, what a Buddha is, is a person who becomes completely aware of the nature of the reality. And by that complete awareness, uh, becomes uh, free of suffering. So then has, is stuck in the very awkward situation of not being able to help others become free of suffering that way, just like a teacher cannot cause this, force the student or cause the student to understand. They can only provide methods whereby the student can themselves come to understand, right? You can't, if you, many of you might be teachers actually, of one kind or another. Every mother is a teacher, for sure, and I see there are many here who must be mothers, fathers. And you can't make that kid understand that you can give lots of clues and hints and, and um, reasons and so on, and then they will eventually understand, hopefully. And uh, so that's sort of what, that's a little, very tiny nutshell about Buddha. Then, apparently one time during his teaching career, 45 years long, that the Buddha had, he was in a medical mood, more physical medical mood, as well as mental and spiritual. And um, he looked at the world and saw beings suffering in the world, which he was not. He, when you understand this, you are free of the suffering, which is a surprise. And um, he was surprised himself. He said when it happened, he was rather happy. <laughs> Tell I about it. And then he felt, he saw, when he, when he became free of that suffering by understanding the reality, when he looked at other beings, this is the funny one, when he looked at them, he saw that basically they were kind of made of that freedom themselves. In other words, they were, they were kind of made of energy in a certain way that 
if it was flowing, they would be, they should be happy if they knew their own true nature. But because they don't, they are feeling very dissatisfied and fundamentally they feel like alienated from the rest of the universe, you know, self versus everything else. And once you feel that, then it's a struggle to, to where, where, how is, what's my share here? What's my state here? Is the world doing what I need? Am I getting what I need from it? Uh, is it not bothering me in some way? Consuming me in some way? And once you do that, then basically, it, 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 when stress is there, it's you versus the, every, everything in the universe, and you lose, of course. It's not even, it's not really a genius idea. It's very obvious. But whereas if you understand your relationship to the universe, and you realize that, in a way, it and you are totally interwoven, then apparently you, you don't feel alienated in that way and you're able to feel happy rather than suffer. So, but then he saw that a lot of the people he was able to therefore help in his lifetime who to teach uh, were not able to study what he was teaching because they were too sick. So that's when he got into a medical mood. Okay, I'm, I, It was circled around to explain that. And the minute he did, he turned blue. <laughs> he turned dark blue. And there's a symbolic reason for that. The medicine Buddha is, uh, has this blue color. And uh, of course there's a legend where these seven brothers came from this other universe to help him out with the medicine teaching. So the, the seven are up above, if you, in this painting for example, they are the seven. And, um, and sort of let him be a medicine Buddha. And then he created a vision around himself, which is what this place is dedicated to, where temporarily in his field, everyone also felt somehow less alienated and they felt, you know, normally we're worried about germs, we're worried in the woods out here, we're worried about ticks in the warmer weather, you know, we're worried about bugs, we're worried about the food, maybe something wrong with it, you know, pollution of different kinds, right? We're worried about what might come at us from the outside in regard. Someone coughs, you know, we're worried we're going to catch a cold. Whereas the medicine Buddha vision is everything is medicine. The whole, all plants, especially the plant world is really, the medicine Buddha holds a plant in this hand, which is something called the Myrobalan plant. The, ter the Latin word is Terminalia chibulia, which are the, in Sanskrit they call the Arura plant, Aru. And there are varieties of it, and it's a kind of panacea medicine. It grows in India in trees, small trees. And he's holding a branch of that with several Aru the kind of nuts, I think, they are, which they grind into powder when they make medicine. So he holds that plant. And he sort of, therefore, reminds us of our interconnection with the plant world. And, um, and so in his field, everyone suddenly felt connected to things and that they saw the positivity of everything. And in his vision, even a poison, in a certain amount, mixed with knowledge, can be a medicine. Right? And then uh, even, even things that are normally healthy, if done in excess or the wrong combinations, can be poison. So he had a vision like that. And then in that vision, he taught a medicine teaching, uh, which is recorded in various forms. And uh, according to the Buddhists, it has influenced what's known as the Ayurvedic tradition in India. And eventually it becomes very interconnected in China and Korea and Japan with their medical traditions. One of the reasons that Buddhism spread from India everywhere was they never had any crusade or anything like that. And the reason it spread is that the Buddhist monks and nuns it seemed to know more about healing people than the local physicians. And usually they healed an empress or a grandmother, you know, emperor, uh, 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 you know a queen mother or something in China or Korea or some, <coughs> one of the sub-kingdoms of China. And then they would take an interest and then they would take an interest in the spiritual teaching. Usually when they learned about the medicine, when the medicine benefited them. And uh, so that's the medicine Buddha. And we have a meditation here. Maybe should we introduce that meditation? Sure. We have a meditation that is kind of the signature meditation of, of uh, Menla. And you, we might do that together. You want to do that? You want to do a little meditation? So sit in, sit, sit, take, you know, sit up in a meditation posture. And uh, you can stay in the chair, but cross the ankles if you're in the chair. Try to keep your back a little straight, tuck your chin, and make your eyes half closed, mostly closed. Uh, better a little open if you can, but, and looking like at your tip of your nose, something really boring visual field. And um, hands, uh, palms flat on one another in, in the lap. 
And or sometimes I actually like to clasp the fingers like that. I don't know why. But I know that's not, that's not really kosher, but I like to I like that. With the th thumb tips touching, whichever way you do it. And um, then draw a few breaths to calm down. Meaning just you be with your breath. And it's very interesting, you know, the most beginning thing of being with your breath that Sharon talked about in the highest, most esoteric Buddhist Tantra, when you do it combined with a certain sort of insight, it's like the supreme thing. <laughs> it's the highest possible thing. Most advanced. You dissolve into your own central channel, and your chakras open, and you know, there's ways of describing it. But uh, it's where you go, you, you conquer death, actually. You realize the true nature of reality and go beyond, you know, you become conscious from your soul level or something like that. You can put it all those kinds of ways. Anyway, you just calm down and, and breathe. And when you pay attention to your breath, it's very hard not to alter it. You know, then you sort of want to take an extra deep breath or breathe quickly. And then you can a little bit modify to try to breathe sort of slowly. And um, unless your nose is congested, it's good to breathe it through the nostrils, mostly. And then, the signature of Menla thing is the following. You turn your attention back toward yourself, back into yourself, as if you were outside of yourself a little bit looking into you, looking into your own face, into your own brain, into your own physical body, and looking for your real essence or your real identity or what's really you within yourself. And when you do that, just quickly, don't, don't make a big strain out of it, you get, you should feel slightly puzzled and maybe a tiny bit disoriented since you don't really find any place immediately to land upon. Your chest rises and falls, you know, the air goes in and out of your nostrils into your lungs, and your, the diaphragm goes up and down, and your, your ribs expand, your chest. And the brain is like a bunch of, you have a model of it in your mind from all the neuroscience lectures you attended. And it's like a, a labyrinth, the, you, you don't really find yourself in it. And um, although someone may pres presume there's a particular neuron that's you, but you don't find them. When you look in a quick way, you don't find it at the heart, you don't find it in the nose, you don't find it, you don't know where, you, so you sort of don't know what to find that's the real you. And then, but in this case, don't be worried about feeling a little disoriented, just let go of your sense of identity, meaning same essential sameness. And along with that, let go of your world description, the atlas world that you hold around you, like where you are and what it is and what's up, up and down and in and out and all of this. And sort of let yourself melt away, kind of. Kind of go down to where your subatomic particles dissolve into light. You could pure light, you could say. Just casually, you know, no big thing. After all, the scientists tell us we are made of atoms. Really, you know, like what we think of as solid skin is really a bunch of atoms and molecules. And then the quantum people tell us the atoms. Nobody has quite found the ultimate solid component in an atom, or even in subatomic particles. And then there's a place where the particles kind of escape into light, where they sort of they become every, go everywhere and disappear. So you just we're just mimicking that in a, just a, like a slight fantasy. 
and then realize that, that since we can't really put our finger on the solidity of the self, at least not quickly, we rise up, imagine that you rise up in a kind of ideal body, energy body, that's your ideal meditative self, and then you look up with your sort of mind's eye, the third eye of your forehead or something, you look up through the skull, through the roof, through the time of day into the sky, and then in the sky you see the medicine Buddha. You see this blue, deep blue being in a shining sort of sunny, moonlit, sunny, sunlit sky with fluffy clouds, and around him all other kinds of healing beings, doctors, ancient time even, like you know Obi-Wan Kenobi, how he appears in Star Wars after he, is, he, he died in a sort of luminous, transparent, or semi-transparent body. And then you can add to the host that you see around the Medicine Buddha, whoever has been a healing influence in your life, and, um, or in your mind, could be historical figures, could be spiritual teachers from any religious traditions, angels, whatever, whatever. There's like a whole heavenly host up there in this meditative space, like you're in a shrine world with all kinds of healing beings. And then they're smiling down at you because they're surprised that your imagination has discovered their presence. But actually they are, they are there looking after living beings, human beings and other living beings, all the time anyway, in some sort of subtle light body form. And when you imagine them, you're actually contacting their real presence. Even though you can't necessarily, unless you're highly trained, you can't hold the inner vision in a stable way. Just like you could think of the Washington Monument or something for a moment in your mind's eye, if you've ever seen it. But then you would, it would be hard to hold on to it, to have it steadily appear there in your mind's sky, let's call it. But you sort of, once you encounter it, you have a sense that it's there, that Medicine Buddha is there, that all these healing beings are there. And then you imagine that rays of blessing, of like rainbow rays, flow down from that Medicine Buddha. And they flow down in a gentle, like a rainbow, shimmering, and they come into you and penetrate your crown and flow into your body and energize you. And the different colored energy rays stimulate your molecules and cells and make you feel clear and calm and healed. And your sort of kinks in your sense of being <coughs> are kind of washed away, little shadows in your thoughts. And then notice around you, in your meditative space, are all kinds of other beings actually a huge host of them. And in the front rows are ones you recognize. So in the front rows on the left side are your loved ones, either who may be here nearby you now or who may be back home or maybe in history if they've passed or maybe in other countries. And then in front in the row, rows directly ahead are acquaintances who you know about that you don't have strong feelings about, you sort of don't really know them, but you're a little familiar with them. And then in the front rows on the right side are beings you've had trouble with, you might be afraid of, even enemies. You may not have physically met them, or they may not have yet hurt you, but when you think of them, you feel uncomfortable because they're like enemies. They could be enemies, you're afraid of them, they have hurt you in the past, or you feel they might hurt you in the future. But then the, the energies, the rainbow rays that you're filling up with and are soothing you and healing you and making you feel 
okay where you are and, and when you are. Kind of it overflows from you naturally, which, which it is when you feel really well. When you look at another, you look upon them benevolently, kind of you feel like you feel well, why don't they feel well, or you wish they did feel well, or maybe you notice they feel well. And so you radiate out to them that positive feeling. It just automatically flows to you from Medicine Buddha and all the gods and angels and heavenly hosts and human healers and whoever it is that has ever been benevolent and beneficial to you. And then this all flows through you toward all the beings around you, but also enemies and acquaintances as well as loved ones. So it's hard to not favor the loved ones, but the idea is it just reflects from you in all directions. And in Tibetan tradition and Indian Mahayana tradition, they have, a, they have the idea that when you do a session of meditation, even if you're mainly going to focus on your breath, that it's a good idea to create a, an imaginary setting like this. And in a way, that's what you do when you go to a meditation hall, with maybe a Buddha image in the front of it. In some traditions, in a Zen tradition, you have bodhisattvas behind you, and you just have a wall in front of you, not a Buddha image. But there is, but most traditions you have a Buddha image of some kind, maybe sometimes some ancient patriarchs and monks and things, famous monks. And so that's creating a setting where you feel you're in a field of your own potential. You're not just worshipping like some other being, because again, Buddha said he could not save you. But you're inspired by being in the field of someone who felt saved, delivered from suffering themselves by some, through some understanding and experience. <coughs> and they saw other beings as capable of the same freedom that they had achieved. So then you feel in the field of that. That's, that's what's an inspiring thing. But before you focus on whatever your meditation theme is, you create a, set, a setting like that, so that you kind of feel kind of perked up on your best focus, even if it's still quite distracted, but still you sort of set yourself in a certain positive setting with a feeling of positive support in your environment, like a shrine that inspires you. And wise beings and loving beings that bless you. And so you then forget about that and do what you're doing. But that puts you in a state of receptivity to what insights you might have yourself inside. So this is the wisdom of the, that tradition. Don't worry if you can't keep track of whatever you envisioned. Once you just have a flashing vision of it, just feel that it's there. And it's just, I say this is our signature Menla thing because while you're here on a retreat, the idea is to have a sense of the presence of the field of the Medicine Buddha within you and around you and in the nature here and the deer that run around. And luckily, I think the ticks are frozen or sleeping. <laughs> so don't worry about them. We will worry again in the spring about them. Take precautions. And the other human beings around. Thank you, Eddie's. <laughs>